Soul Winning Verses in Context is the title of the series. And here is a verse that typically makes it into my soul winning presentation. And that is Revelation 21 verse 8 that says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And that's what we're going to break down today. Um, you will notice that that is familiar or sounds very similar to a lot of passages in the Scripture that will have a, a, a list of all these sins, and it says that these aren't going to go into the kingdom of heaven uh, and all this. And you can see why people would kind of misread that and think that, oh, man, see, we got to do good works. We can't do all these things or else we won't be able to go to heaven. But the thing is, whenever you read the list, you're like, who can... Who can make it past that list? And so when we use this soul winning, <clears throat> we're usually saying, you know, look at this list here. There's more, there's murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers, and idolaters. And so that's a pretty bad, li you know, bad list of, of sins is what we usually tell somebody. And then we say, but read on. It says, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. And so what we're telling them is, you know, hey, even if you tell one lie, you know, that is enough to mean that you deserve to go to hell. And sometimes that's hard for people to swallow. It's hard for them to understand. So they'll even try to reason with this. And I've heard people say, well, I mean, just because you told one lie, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a liar. Well, let's go to chapter 21, the, the very end of the chapter. Verse 27 says, And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So who's a liar? Well, someone that makes a lie is a, is, a, is a liar. And so when we read that, it could be, you know, a little bit scary if you're, if you're afraid of where your eternal destiny is because you're like, whoa, I've told a lie. And you know, the interesting thing about that is I remember that was the big sin whenever I was a kid that had me scared. And it had me worried about how do I know for sure if I'm going to go to heaven? Of course, at that time, my uh, parents didn't go to uh, church really, and, and nobody had taught me the gospel. Uh, but I knew of heaven and hell, and I knew that sins were wrong, and I knew lying was wrong. And I remember as about seven-year-old kid, lying was the big sin. And if you lied, it was just like, oh, that what a terrible thing. But I knew, even at that young age, I had told lies. Uh, and so I was like, well, how do I know that I can cover that up? You know, I've talked to a lot of people that, that act like, well, if I do more good than bad, you know, then I can go to heaven. And I even knew as a kid that didn't make sense. I'm like, it has to be judged. How do I know what the final judgment's going to be? I mean, I have sinned against God. And so that was actually something that kind of brought me to understanding where I, once I heard the gospel, it was just like, oh, now I get it. Like, I can't pay for my, uh, for my salvation. And so that was, uh, that was a blessing. This is what we're trying to tell people when we use this passage of Scripture. But just like the other verses that we've used in this series and the ones that we'll continue to use, you know, um, what I'm going to preach isn't necessarily, we wouldn't go into detail and explain all this and explain like when uh, in the, the time frame of, of end events, you know, this first takes place. Uh, but I think it'll help us since we use these verses, it kind of help us to have a deeper understanding of the verse and help us use it accurately whenever we are uh, talking about it. And so let me uh, break down this chapter into uh, three different thoughts here. First of all is this, John is describing a future event at the great white throne judgment. Okay, now this is just going to be a lot like a study, okay, uh, of, of this chapter here. John's describing a future event at the great white throne judgment. Okay, this is what um, what we're calling here. He says he saw a great white throne, and uh, that's verse 10. He was carried away, uh, he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem descend out of heaven. No, that's not it. Uh... Somewhere there's a great white throne. <laughs> Tell me, what did I do? There's a great white throne in there. No, maybe it's chapter 20. Maybe it's 20 verse 10. 
Man, this is embarrassing. Okay, yeah, 20, verse 11. Uh, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face uh, the earth and the heaven fled away, there was found no place for them. Okay, so <clears throat> there are apparently what we can see from chapter 20, uh, which is, you know, which comes before 21. When you read things in context, you always want to read the chapters before and the chapters after, okay? Uh, what, what we're talking about in chapter 20 are two resurrections and two judgments. Okay, now this is going to be the key to understanding this whole judgment thing because it does get con confusing to some people. All right, so look at, hold your place there in chapter 20. And I want to show you first the other uh, judgment. Okay, we're going to talk about these two judgments and, uh, and two resurrections. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter five. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, talking about our bodies, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. That's talking about our glorified bodies that we will have uh, in heaven. Okay, if so be that we be clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would, uh, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon with mortality, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the self same, this is God, who also hath given us, uh, given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Okay, so we understand that when we are absent from this body, we'll be present with the Lord, which is, uh, you know, kind of a, a good proof text to show somebody who believes in what's called soul sleep. They believe that, you know, somebody will just... Uh, once you die, like you don't, you're not resurrected. Uh, you know, you don't, you don't see God until the resurrection. And I can understand why some people would jump to that, but there's enough passages in Scripture to lead me to say no. Once we die, you know, we're we're in the presence of the Lord. And this is like, hey, we would rather be in the presence of the Lord and absent from this body, but on earth, it's the opposite. Like we're stuck, we're stuck in this body, and <laughs> we're groaning in this body. And we got the aches and pains and we got all that. And we kind of wish our body's just wishing it could have the glorified body. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? I mean, most people in this assembly are pretty young. I mean, you know, comparatively to Iola, I think, uh, uh, I don't know. I'm looking around. Our, our, our congregation is getting a little older, maybe. <laughs> but uh, uh, here's what I know. Like, I still feel like I got a, my body's pretty decent, but I would not want to live in this body for eternity. I mean, that'd be kind of a prison if you think about it. It would be really nice to have a glorified body uh, and definitely not one that's going to have the aches and the pains and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of what he's talking about. There's this groaning uh, that we have right now. And there's even a spiritual groaning like, you know, hey, we're, we're in this flesh. We're bound by sin and all this kind of stuff. And so we want that inner man, that spirit part. We want it to have a glorified body and be free from this body of sin. <laughs> OK, so uh, where did I leave off there? Uh, let me see here. So let's go to verse nine. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in this, in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciousness. Now, you got to remember, he's talking to Christians here. He's talking about this judgment, how we're going to stand before God uh, or stand before Christ, and we're going to be judged for the things that we did on this earth. Now, go to Revelation again. And...
We'll look at chapter 20 and go to verse 5. Revelation 20, verse 5. Again, our text is in 21, but we're given the background to this. So Revelation 20, starting in verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Okay, this is what we call the millennial reign of Christ or the millennia, the millennium or the millennial kingdom, whichever. And it says, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on such the second death hath no power, but that uh, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Okay, so it's a little bit confusing where that phrase is. This is the first resurrection. But if you understand what he's saying, he's saying, okay, so you're, there's a first resurrection. Then there's a thousand years where we rule and reign with Christ. Okay, we read about that in verse 5. And then there's going to be, after the thousand years, a second uh, resurrection. Okay, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, to the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So after the thousand years, Christ is let out of his prison, let out of hell, and he rounds up apparently enough people that are on this earth who are still willing to go to battle against the Lord. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, encompassed the camp of the saints about uh, the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Verse 11. This is the one that I couldn't find earlier. <laughs> and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book, books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Okay? We don't have any part, according to, uh, according to what we just read up here, if we are part of the first resurrection, which I'll try to explain here in a minute, if we're part of the first resurrection, second death hath no, has no effect on us. Okay, we will die once in this body, and we'll get our glorified body, we'll be in the presence of the Lord, we'll be waiting for the thousand-year reign where we rule uh, and reign with Christ. Okay, but then there's what's known as a second judgment at the great white throne, and after that second judgment, there's what's called the second death. Okay, and it says death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. So what you have is during that thousand years, there are people who, who through that thousand years, they didn't come to earth to rule and reign with Christ, so they haven't been resurrected yet. Christians, however, will be resurrected in what's, what we typically here refer to as the rapture. Okay, this is the way I, I'm just giving you a whole bunch of eschatology in one little snippet. So the, the, um, the rapture is where Christ comes and basically is calling up the dead in Christ, those who are in the grave. He's going to call them up. Now, those who whose bodies have already perished, you know, maybe some have been cremated, some have, you know, been in the sea, like we're talking, we see this, talk about sea and everything, and, and, you know, what happens to their bodies? How are they resurrected again? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> but God, in whom all things consist, right, uh, God knows where every atom in this world is, and everywhere that those atoms go, whenever it's destroyed, I don't know how he's going to do it, but somehow he's going to give us, he's going to raise up a new body and a glorified body. It's going to be in this perfect state, and everybody is going to be able to get that. But these who come in the second death, they're going to be resurrected too. So I imagine in the same manner, and they're going to stand before God, and they're going to be judged, as we read right here, according to the, uh, the things that were written in the books. Okay, now, most people that I've talked to have, 
have you know speculated that the books are referring to the Bible, okay? Because we call the 66 books of the Bible, and most people say they're judged, and this makes sense, judged out of the things that are in these books, all right? If we're judged according to all these things, we already read, even liars right, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. And if we're judged out of those things and we get what we deserve, there's no hope for us, right? And so this is, uh, can't be the same judgment that the believers go through because, uh, because that, that doesn't. These are apparently uh, after the two resurrections. You have the judgment seat of Christ at his appearing. Let's look at that real quick. Look at Revelation 22, verse 12. Okay, after he has already talked about all the things that are going to happen, and we get to the very end, now he's going to give this general uh, uh, kind of conclusion to those people who are reading, the, reading this book in the present time. And verse 12, let's start with actually verse uh, 10. And he said unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his works, uh, as according as his works shall be. So there's this, you're left with this idea that, hey, one day Christ is coming back, and when he comes, he's going to reward, you know, us according to our works. So if he comes back and rewards us according to our works, um, you know, some of us are re recognizing right away, hey, if, if, if every, because there's a verse in the Bible that says every idle word, we shall give account for that. And you're like, what am I going to get? Is he going to just come and he's going to judge me according to all the, you know, verses in the Bible? Is he going to, is he going to uh, open up the books in front of me? Well, the Bible actually doesn't say that for the believer. The Bible says uh, that he's going to open up the books at the great white throne judgment. But at the seat of Christ, when he comes and takes us and he has his reward with us, you know, how is he going to give us according to our works? Well, <clears throat> I've looked at this before. And if you're in here uh, and you've never seen this, uh, I mean, if you've seen it multiple times, I apologize, but go to Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 3. If you, if you haven't seen this, this is eye-opening, okay? But if you've seen this, you know, I, I doubt that you'd really get tired of it <clears throat> because this is good news for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's, let's start with verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth there, thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon, for other foundation can no man lay that, that, than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be real, revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So, when Christ comes... Now, I don't know how literal to take the fire. You know what I mean? Remember the, uh, John the Baptist said when he comes, uh, he will baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire, right? Now, uh, that literal, he's going to come a second time and he's going to literally uh, be trying the world by fire. We read about that in Revelation. But I think here this is pretty much understood to be metaphoric. But the idea is this, your works will be tried, and it'll be tried as such by fire. Okay, so he compares your works to these precious substances that we have on earth. The most precious substance you can think of, gold, silver, precious stones, like all the ones that you uh, tried your best to pronounce. <laughs> all these precious stones that I can't name. And then he says, wood, hay, and stubble. Those aren't precious materials, right? Tried by, if tried by the fire, gold, silver, precious stone, that's going to last. But the wood, hay, and the stubble, that's going to burn up. 
Okay, so here's what I'm getting at. When Christ comes, he's going to give out his reward according to the good and the bad. But guess what? The bad, what's going to happen to the bad works? They just cease to exist. We don't get any credit for them. We don't get any rewards for them. Now, some people, you know, we're supposed to be as Christians laying up treasures in heaven. We're, all the good things we do, the good works we do, even when we go soul winning and, and, uh, and try to you know, build one another up and all that, we're, we're just by faith saying, hey, I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm going to give things up and he's going to reward me a hundredfold in the kingdom. And, uh, and, and we do all this uh, kind of stuff, hoping that he's going to, um, you know, reward us. But you know what? Sometimes there's another problem that people can lose their reward. All right. I remember brother, uh, uh, brother Ryan and I were talking about that. Actually, when we went soul winning the other day, we were kind of talking about this, uh, this subject here. He said, well, what are the rewards? I have no clue. <laughs> okay. I can speculate. I can say in the millennial kingdom, it looks like maybe we'll be given cities and kingdom and authority and all that stuff, which doesn't sound all that appealing to me at this current time. <laughs> I don't really want all that. Uh, but who knows how that's going to take place in the future. But here's what I know. I want to be the best servant I can for God. And so I want to lay up my treasures and I want to just be, you know, rewarded with whatever it is he's going to reward me with. And what happens is sometimes people, the Bible talks about people losing their reward. For instance, uh, Jesus talks about the man that would fast to be seen by men. And if he's doing it to be seen by men and men see him and say, hey, that's a righteous man. Look at him fasting over there. Well, he lost his reward because his reward is everybody's saying, oh, what a righteous, holy man. You see what I'm saying? So if he would have done it in secret and not made a big deal about it, he would have kept his reward, but he loses it because of his, you know, his, his motive and all that kind of stuff. So unfortunately, there are people in this world who are Christians who do great things for the Lord. But the end sometimes makes you think, man, they lost all their rewards. You know, they became something that God didn't want them to be. You know, I think of Solomon. Uh, Solomon started out, God gave him so much. And at the very beginning, he was righteous and he asked God for wisdom instead of riches and all that. And God allowed him to have riches on this earth so that he could build the kingdom and so that he could, you know, uh, give it to God. But he ends up letting it go to his head and he seeks after women and, and all these things of the world. And at the very end of his life, you can see where he lost so much that he would have uh, had for the Lord. So in that first judgment where Christ comes back, and we're resurrected, and he gives out to people according to their works, that only applies to the Christians at that point, because we're the only ones that have resurrected. The rest are still, uh, are still dead. Okay, And he's going to give us according to our works, but he's not necessarily going to punish us according to the bad that we've done, because how would he punish us? You know, how, what, would, what, what, would he, what would he do? He's not going to take away heaven from us. And so all you have are rewards, and then rewards that are taken away. And I don't know exactly what that looks like. I'm just saying that this is, this is how that, uh, that plays out. Now, if you look at how, and for the record, I just totally have went off of my notes. <laughs> so I don't know how we're ever going to come back. But if you look at Psalm 103, just follow along with me the best you can. Psalm 103, here's David talking about God and God's judgment. And you see here, this sounds quite a bit different than this idea that I'm going to be judged for everything that I do. Even if I tell a lie, you know, I'm going to be judged for that. Here's what David says in Psalm 103. Look at verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Now that's God, I mean, that's the concept of God in his dealings with and his punishment towards his children. Right. And he's like, man, I, I've already forgotten those things. You know, I, I remember when I was a kid and I would I would do something stupid and then I'd be like, my parents are never going to forgive me. Anybody ever feel like that? Like, it's like I'm going to hold they're going to hold this over my head for the rest of my life. They're never going to trust me. They're never going to forgive me. And it's like two weeks from now, they're kind of like, what are you talking about? I don't even remember that. <laughs> They just, they have this mercy and they just like, hey, their, their love for you is such that 
They, they were willing to forget the bad things that you did. Now, the problem is, it's not like God just has no regard for whether you sin or not. Sin is wicked. Sin is, sin is very disappointing to God. And it has to be punished. And He's going to make sure it punished. And this is why, when they're standing before God at the great white throne judgment at the, after the second resurrection, and they're standing before God, and they're being judged according to the works, do you realize their punishment that they're going to get is eternal damnation in hell? That's serious. That's, a, that's quite a punishment. You know, I was just talking about on Wednesdays, uh, started talking about the prison systems. And, and so this is kind of an introduction. I did this last Wednesday, uh, but I talked about uh, how hell is kind of like a prison, if you think about it. Like even whenever Satan is locked up for a thousand years, it's just a temporary, you know, holding place and final judgment where he's cast into the lake of fire, which I don't know what the difference is between hell and, uh, and the lake of fire. I mean, it's just kind of like more hell, I guess. But, uh, you know, but he goes from, uh, you know, because it says death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. And so, uh, you know, that, I, I, as I started studying about the prison system, and I, I don't know who, else, who in here has ever been in a jail cell. Like, I'm hoping not because you've gotten into trouble, but uh, maybe just like, you visited a, a prison or something and you walked into a jail cell and, and saw what it was like and you saw this bed, uh, you know, about comes out about this far from the wall and like right at the feet is like a toilet and like another wall. <laughs> and you have like maybe a little desk right here and then another wall and you're, com you're in this little compartment and there's some people that get life in prison. And they'll get like one hour a day to do recreation. They get to come out and eat or whatever. But most of the life is lived in that little jail cell. And, you know, I've often thought, man, I, you know, if I had life in jail, I think I'd rather just die. <laughs> but, you know, to the, to the lost person, now they don't maybe know this, but to the lost person, boy, that little jail cell would be the best thing that, they, that they're ever going to have right? If they don't get saved, because going from that to the final judgment and being cast into the lake, which burneth with fire and stone, where the worm dieth not and, and there's gnashing on teeth and everything that the Bible uses to describe hell. Again, I can't tell you exactly what it's like, but everything the Bible uses to describe what hell's like, it's like the ultimate punishment. So it's not like God's just like, well, I just love everybody. And I know I say not to do that, but if you do it, you know, who cares? You'll get away with it anyway. It's not like that, right? The wrath of God will be poured out on all wickedness. That's why even someone that tells one lie, you know, it, once they're judged, the final punishment, as we saw in, in, in Revelation 21, is they're cast into the lake, uh, the lake of fire. And so uh, the Christian, however, the good news about that is that the Christian, you know, never has to see that. Why? Because Christ bore our iniquity. Christ became sin for us. And God poured his wrath upon Christ, right, to pay for, for our sins. And now he sees us as holy. He sees us as righteous. He, he, he remembers our sin no more. Look at Hebrews uh, chapter 10. Again, look at this and compared to this harsh God that's going to, that's even going to throw a liar into hell. Uh, and, and you think, man, this is... And, and look, the whole context of Hebrews chapter 10 is that even as Christians, even though we're saved, we should recognize the terror of God. We should understand that God doesn't play around with sin. And so in this life, as, even as Christians, God will uh, hold you accountable for the things that you do. But look at uh, what he says in uh, verse 12. So Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. <clears throat> but this man, talking about Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Wherefore, the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he, said bef uh, he, he hath said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them in those days. This is a quote from Jeremiah. Uh, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and in, my, and in their minds will I write them in their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. 
Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Now, um, I don't want to get too deep on the millennial kingdom and, and all that, but uh, so basically what I wanted you to just look at in this verse is the fact that he is, uh, he is showing his, his love and his mercy. He's saying, hey, I remember those sins no more. Uh, Christ has paid for them once and for all, and he has perfected uh, you know, those who are, are sanctified. Look, you know, there's this idea out there. The Catholics teach this uh, sainthood. Right. Like everybody has to, you know, very few in the Catholic uh, mindset ever reach sainthood. You know, I don't know if they I'm, I'm assuming that they probably pronounce Mother Teresa a saint. Uh, I'm not quite sure about that because there's a certain uh, number of things that they have to do. They have to have done certain things on this life. And then I think there even has to be some kind of a miracle that takes place in their lifetime. Or maybe it could even be after they die, some miracle that's attributed to their name. I mean, it's really bizarre, the, some of the things that they do. But, you know, if all goes well, then the Pope gets to pronounce whoever he wants a saint. And then they're like, oh, now this person's a saint. Well, recently I preached on, I guess it was on Thursday, I preached on what it means to be a Christian. And one of the words in the Bible for a Christian is a saint. Okay. And a saint means somebody who's holy, somebody who's perfect, somebody who's, who's righteous, right? Uh, all these kind of things. We were talking about a saint. You know when you reach sainthood? The moment you get saved. <laughs> You're sanctified. Now you say, well, what about this body? You got a lot of learning and discipling, and you got to learn how to, how to grow and all this. Well, that's true. That's true. Okay, but that's all flesh. You know, the spiritual man, the, in, the, the inner man is made righteous. He's holy. And so when you uh, get to heaven and you receive the rewards for the things that you've done in this life, you know, they're all going to be spiritual things. Things that were done, you know, for Christ, things that were done in the spirit, those things that were done by the flesh, those are the things that are going to burn up and just cease to exist. You know, hey, yeah, they get to go into the lake, which burn up a fire and brimstone, right? But you, in your uh, perfected body and in your glorified body, you never have to taste of the second death. What a, what a wonderful thing. <clears throat> and, and so simple, really, if you think about it. I mean, this is why some people get almost offended, like, how could you just act like it's, it's just that cheap? And it, 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 I mean, you don't get any, you don't get any cheaper than free, right? How do you, how can you just make salvation just free and, and say that nobody has to work for it or anything like that? Well, look, here's why I can say it because the grace of God, I mean, we ought to be thankful for that. We ought to be just, we ought to just marvel at the fact that God spared us from eternal damnation and took the wrath upon us, uh, himself. And so, uh, so here, when he talks about this verse, it is describing a time, okay, where all these things, in fact, look at the first thing on that list. What was it? Uh, uh, Revelation 21, 8 says, but the fearful and unbelieving, right? That's the beginning of this list, right? This kind of like identifies who these people are and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. These are all, you know, unbelievers. And it's just, it's just talking about all their different sins and all the things that, uh, that, that is among these people. You say, have you ever told a lie? Well, of course, you know, there might be somebody who's saved, who's been a whoremonger in their past or even now, or a murderer. You know, or maybe they were caught up in idolatry at some point or in witchcraft or something like that. And then they got saved or maybe, like I said, they got saved and they still dabble in some of those things. And you're just like, well, how could that person, you know, ever be forgiven of those? I mean, they need to be judged for that. No, Jesus Christ was already judged for that. And this is why I go back to uh, uh, 20, uh, chapter 20, verse 15. He says, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It doesn't say whosoever, you know, had done any of these things. It's whosoever was not writ, who, who was not found written in uh, the book of life. Okay, and then it says it again at the end of chapter 21. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So how do you go to heaven? You got to be written in the book, Lamb's book of life. Has nothing to do with the work that you, uh, the works that you do. Okay, so there are two judgments. 
we will only have, take part in the judgment seat of Christ where we'll be rewarded for what we did for him and we'll lose you know, all the things that didn't matter for Christ. All that will be gone and we'll receive our glorified bodies when it's time for the uh, millennial kingdom. The, uh, then the second judgment, which is the great white throne judgment, is what we're reading about in this text, okay, Revelation 21. Uh, this judgment takes place after Christ rules uh, 4,000 years. That was verses 2 through 5. And look at uh, Ephesians 5, okay? So if this takes place after... after the, the bride has already been presented uh, to the Lord, because this is after the kingdom, okay? The kingdom has been offered up to the Lord. Ephesians chapter 5. And look at verse 27. That he, well, let me back up. Okay, so this is in the context here. He is talking about the relationship of the husband and wife, and he compares that to the Lord. So look at verse 22, actually. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be uh, to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And so here's how Christ loved the church gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Now, <clears throat> the church, who is the church? You know, we're not talking about the Catholic Church. We're not talking about the universal church, which would be just like basically everybody that calls themselves Christians. The church is made up of saved people, right, who've been, uh, you know, called out from the world, basically, and they're saved. And uh, we talk about local churches because the Bible uses the word churches most of the time. When it's talking about a church, it's talking about a particular local body or an assembly of, of, of believers. Okay, but... <clears throat> In a church, okay, because church just means like an assembly or congregation. So in a church, um, uh, uh, let me see here. We, in, in, the word church, you know, usually, like I said, we refer to a local body, meaning that there's a church here, there's a church over there, there's a church over there. But theoretically, if all saved people gathered together, we would be in one congregation. So I believe there are times when the Bible talks about the congregation as in, hey, in heaven, we're going to be seated in heaven together. We're going to be in one assembly, one uh, congregation. And so this is the church that Christ has died for. This is the church that God has that Christ has presented uh, to the Lord uh, as, as holy and spotless and without blemish and all this stuff. So, you know, the thing is, individually, we are, uh, you know, we're spotless. On the, the inner man is spotless. The inner man will go to heaven, and we don't have to worry about that. But as a church body, like a physical church body, you know, this is what we're working on. And we're constantly trying to get better. We're trying to grow. We're trying to be more productive and more fruitful for the Lord and all that stuff. You know, and that's what we're trying to present to, to the Lord, right, for, for the rewards uh, that, are, that are similar. And the whole book of Revelation, when it starts out, it's talking to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And it's just it's telling them, hey, you did these things good. You're going to be rewarded for that. You did these things bad. You're going to be cursed for that. You know, talking about on earth, right? But ultimately what he's trying to do is he's trying to present uh, this uh, the church to, to the Lord spotless, all right? But uh, after this time where the bride has already been adorned to her husband, then we receive, you know, our eternal life, uh, Romans, uh, I mean, uh, Revelation 22, I mean, I'm sorry, Revelation 21, 6 talks about uh, drinking of the water, the fountain of life. Uh, we've overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the Bible talks about. And uh, let me see here, uh, because I messed up my notes, um, and I didn't follow my notes, I've got to backtrack. Okay, but at this point of the story, when we get to Revelation 21, 
believers are already in their glorified bodies. They're already pure. They're already uncorrupted uh, and, and made spotless by the blood of the Lamb. So the, therefore, the ones that he's talking to in chapter 21 are clearly those who are unsaved. Okay, and that was going to be the third point. So who do you think, you know, of all the people in this world, let's add Mother Teresa to the list, who do you think, I'm picking on her because I read this morning, uh, I did a Sunday school lesson on Judge Not, and I read this quote from her about how we're not supposed to judge anybody, and so she's been on my mind all day. Add her to the list of all the people who ever lived in this world, who do you think is going to get to heaven based on their own works? If they really say, hey, well, you know, I accept, you know, I always use this analogy. I've used this at the doors before when I'm preaching the gospel too. Like, you know, if God said, I don't know, I got this from somebody. It's probably like a, a contemporary church or something. I don't know. If God said, what should I do? I mean, I mean, what? why should I allow you to come into heaven? Like, why should I allow you into my kingdom? You know, what would your answer be? This is what I'll ask some people, okay? And so who in this whole world that's ever lived in this world would would and say, well, the reason you ought to let me in is because I've been a pretty good person. Because I'm telling you, 90% of the people we knock on doors, that's what they say. Oh, yeah, I know I'd go to heaven. Well, why do you think you go to heaven? Eh, I'm a pretty good person. You know, I do right to other people and, and all this kind of stuff. But man, they don't understand that their judgment on judgment day is going to be all the way down to have you ever told a lie? <laughs> you know, you, have you anybody been watching any of the court cases of late. There seems like there's been, maybe just because I have more of an interest in it, but there seem like a lot of big court cases lately. Uh, the Maxwell uh, thing just happened. Of course, uh, Rittenhouse, we talked about that for a while. Then there was the, uh, I can't remember the the name of that, the, that guy's name, but anyway, uh, there's been a lot of court cases lately. And, and you know, the the people that they call up to the stand and they say, hey, did you say this? And we have record of you saying this to the FBI. And we've got, and it's just like, man, all these little minute details because they got to prove that they're wrong. Could you imagine? I don't know how it's going to be, but imagine people going through, no, 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 God, I, I was real good. You know, I don't think it's going to take very long to get the verdict. You know what I mean? It's going to be like, have you ever told a lie? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, but uh, psh, see ya. <laughs> I mean, it's, I think he's going to go through them people pretty quick, all right? Because, uh, because look, in comparison to a holy, righteous God, the God of the universe, the one you know who created all this, you know, in comparison, he's so much higher, so so much more holy and righteous than us that there's there's no way we could ever think that we could bridge that gap on our own by being good. Okay, and so that verse is perfectly accurate for us to use in the way that we do when we use Re Re revelation 21 8 and we say you know hey even liars you know have you ever told a lie you know that according to the bible then that's enough to send you to hell but at that point everybody should say wow you're i deserve to go to hell then because uh because that's uh, you know that's pretty clear all right let me just uh uh skip that verse let's go to matthew 7 and we'll just close with this It amazes me how many times I've heard this verse used to try to prove that works are part of our salvation because it actually says the opposite. Revelation 7, let's go to verse 21. Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So people stop right there. And they say, oh, see, you can't just say, Lord, Lord, you know, that's not enough. You've got to, you know, do the will of the Father. You've got to be obedient. You've got to do all this stuff. But wait a minute. The will of the Father is made clear. Jesus said, here's the will of the Father, that you believe on him whom he's, who he sent. His will was that we would receive Jesus Christ, that we would accept him as our Savior. We would put our faith in him and not in ourselves. That's the, clearly the will of the Father. And it says, many will say to me in that day, what day are we talking about? Well, that's that great white throne judgment, okay? Uh, the saved people at that point have already been uh, given their glorified bodies. But in that judgment day, they're going to say, great white throne judgment, they're going to say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? I can't help reading this and always think about all the Pentecostals that think that they're saved, you know, and they've, oh, well, you know, we speak in tongues and we heal people and all that. We know we're saved. And you're like, well, 
what do you think you have to do to get saved? Well, you just got to be slain by the Spirit, and you got to do all this, and you got to walk right, and you got to live right, and all this kind of stuff. Well, then you're not saved, right? They're the ones that are going to be standing here, and there's a whole lot of others you can fit in this category. A lot of people have compared to Catholics uh, in this, where they're going to say, Lord, Lord, and in thy name have done many wonderful works, right? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Why did he never know them? Because they were never written in the Lamb's book of life. How do you get written in the Lamb's book of life? You've got to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're in the Lamb's book of life. You're not going to be blotted from that. You're not going to, uh, you're, you know, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit to the day of redemption. It's a done deal once you receive Jesus Christ. But all those who continue to say, no, 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 i got to live for him. Now, look, we're supposed to do good works, but why? Rewards, you know, being produ productive and being fruitful for the Lord. This is why we continue to do the works. But if we're trusting in that to get us to heaven, well, we, we are so ignorant. We don't understand because that is never going to get anybody to heaven. In fact, he could look at someone who's done many wonderful works and say, I never knew you. You know, I don't, I don't know you. You, you. you claim to know me. Uh, but you have never been written in the Lamb's book of life. And so we're trying to, when we use this passage and when we give the gospel, we're trying to persuade people not to go to the lake of fire. All right, That's an eternal punishment that nobody has to go to. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, the Bible says, and nobody has to go there. And so we want to persuade people not to do that. And this passage shows that even one lie makes a person deserving of to be safe from that fire is not by being good, you know, it's not by just repenting of all your sins or something like that. It's, it's by trusting and accepting Jesus Christ and what he did for our salvation. And so this is a great verse to use as part of your soul winning presentation. You don't have to preach an hour long message about it like I just did, but just use that verse to prove to them that they have told lies and that they, are, they deserve to go to hell. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. The simplicity of it and yet the com uh, complexity of it. And uh, uh, I just hope that you'll use something I said today to kind of help uh, put in everybody's minds, Lord, number one, just the great, uh, the great love that you showed towards us and just that we would be in awe of your grace and your mercy to us. Uh, and also that even though we're saved and we don't have to worry about the second death, uh, that we should live for you and we should lay up treasures in heaven. And we should build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ and, and uh, we should try to, uh, to serve you to the best of our ability. Uh, but Lord, most importantly, help us show other people that it's only through trusting in Jesus Christ and, and, uh, and accepting the atonement from his blood uh, that was shed that we can have salvation. And I pray that you help us do that in a way that is clear and is uh, uh, persuasive and I pray that you be glorified by our efforts in Jesus' name. Amen.